The Republic of Ireland occupies most of the island of Ireland, which lies across the Irish Sea from the island of Great Britain. The British controlled the area for about 750 years, until 1921, when they made Southern Ireland a dominion. The link with the United Kingdom ended when Ireland became an independent republic in 1949. However, Northern Ireland, which occupies the rest of the island, has remained a part of the United Kingdom. Area 27,133 square miles, 70,273 square kilometers. Population, 2020 est. 4,991,000. The Republic of Ireland consists of four provinces, Leinster, Munster, Connaught, Connacht, and part of Ulster, which are divided into 26 counties. Six counties of Ulster make up Northern Ireland. Beginning in the mid-19th century millions of people left Ireland to live elsewhere because of very poor harvests of potatoes, by far the most important crop, and high unemployment. Today, as a result of the vast migrations, more people of Irish ancestry live outside Ireland than in it. Large numbers of Irish now live in the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Commonwealth countries. In the 1960s the population decline reversed. By the late 20th century, more people were immigrating to Ireland than emigrating from it. The change in the migration pattern accompanied an upturn in Ireland's economy, which made a successful transition from an agricultural base to a diverse, export-driven model. This economic shift was greater in Dublin, the capital and largest city, and in the eastern and southern sections of the country than in the less prosperous west. Land and climate. The island of Ireland is separated from Great Britain by the North Channel, the Irish Sea, and St. George's Channel. On the west the island has a long, scenic coastline on the Atlantic Ocean. Much of the interior is a mostly level plain surrounded by low mountains, particularly in the west and south. Most of the central plain is less than 500 feet, 150 meters, above sea level but the coastal mountains rise to more than 2,000 feet, 600 meters, high. The highest point of 3,414 feet, 1,041 meters, is in the mountains of County Kerry in the southwest. The character of the land surface is the result of early activity by glaciers. The central plain has glacial ridges, and the surrounding mountains were severely eroded during the Ice Age. The glaciers left behind many heaths and bogs, which are poorly drained lands. Peat, partially decayed plant matter from the heaths and bogs, has long been used as fuel in Irish homes and industry. The glaciers also indented Ireland's coasts into many bays and spectacular rocky headlands. Rocky islands fringe the bays in the west and south. The longest river in Ireland is the Shannon, which flows sluggishly for some 160 miles, 260 kilometers, through the central plain on its way to the Atlantic Ocean. In many places the river has been dammed by nature or artificially to create lofts or lakes. The other main rivers that drain the interior are the Blackwater in the south, the Barrow in the southeast, the Boyne in the northeast, and the Moy in the west. Ireland has a maritime climate that is moderated by prevailing southwesterly winds. These winds blow over the warm waters of the North Atlantic Current, keeping the temperatures mild during the winter and cool in summer. Temperatures average about 42 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees Celsius, during the coolest month, February, and about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 degrees Celsius, in the warmest month, August. The highest peaks in the western mountains receive about 100 inches, 250 centimeters, of rain annually. The driest areas, around Dublin in the east, have about 30 inches, 75 centimeters. Snow is common only in the mountains. Plants and animals. Ireland shares most of its plant and animal species with Great Britain and continental Europe. In the past both Ireland and Great Britain were connected to the continent, allowing plant and animal species to migrate overland from Northern Europe. Nevertheless, Irish plant and animal life has some unique features owing partly to the climate and partly to Ireland's eventual separation from the other landmasses. Most of Ireland is covered by grasses, mosses, and lichens. There are relatively few trees. The original hardwood forests were cleared long ago for agriculture or cut for lumber, and most of the present softwood forests were planted by the government. The animals of Ireland include the Irish stoat, the Irish hare, and deer. Birds, especially waterfowl, are abundant. Ireland has no snakes. The only reptile that lives on the island is a species of lizard. People and culture. The Irish are descendants primarily of the ancient Celts, 
but the Vikings, Normans, English, and Scots contributed to their ethnicity as well. Centuries of English rule largely eliminated the use of the ancient Irish language, which started with the Celts. English is the dominant language in the educational system and is spoken throughout Ireland except in certain areas of the West Coast. Nevertheless, the Constitution provides that Irish be the first official language and English the second. Government documents are printed in both Irish and English. Ethnic minorities make up about an eighth of Ireland's population, a proportion that doubled in the first decade of the 21st century. Immigration from the rest of Europe and from Africa and Asia became significant in the last two decades of the 20th century. A key factor in increased immigration to Ireland has been the more open labour market provided by the European Union. The globalised nature of the contemporary Irish economy has also attracted many new residents. The travellers are a native minority group notable for their nomadic lifestyle and their unique language. Ireland's constitution guarantees freedom of religion, and there is no official church. The dominant religion, however, is Christianity. The vast majority of the residents are Roman Catholics. Most of the rest are Anglicans who belong to the Church of Ireland. Ireland's history of mass migrations has had a major impact on the nature of the country and people. Owing largely to emigration from the countryside, the population of Ireland fell steadily from about 6.5 million in 1841 to 2.8 million in 1961. About 1.2 million people left Ireland as a result of the potato famine of the 1840s, most of them moving to the United States or Britain. From 1853 to 1900 about 3.3 million more Irish left the country. The pattern of net outward migration continued almost uninterrupted until the 1990s, when more people migrated to Ireland than left it. By the early 21st century this reversal in net migration had resulted in record population growth. A new wave of Irish emigration began after the Irish economy went into a deep recession in 2008. Several years later, the country's economy began to improve, and immigration levels were once again higher than emigration levels. The Arts. The Irish have a rich literary and artistic heritage. Irish literature has been written largely in English rather than Irish, however. The late 1800s and early 1900s, a period known as the Irish Literary Renaissance, produced such great writers as William Butler Yeats, John Millington Singh, James Joyce, and George Moore. They presented Irish thought and life in works that gained international acclaim. Other distinguished Irish writers include Jonathan Swift, George Bernard Shaw, Oscar Wilde, Samuel Beckett, and Seamus Heaney. The Royal Hibernian Academy of Dublin has developed many Irish painters. High-quality craftwork on jewellery and religious objects, such as Celtic crosses, reflects an ancient artistic tradition. Folk songs and dances, along with traditional storytelling, are featured at festivals that help to preserve Ireland's way of life. The island's colourful customs have spread wherever the Irish have settled throughout the world. Sports and Recreation The Irish are avid sports fans, especially of their native games of Gaelic football, a cross between soccer, association football, and rugby, and hurling, which resembles a rough and tumble version of field hockey. Both are promoted by the Gaelic Athletic Association GAA, founded in 1884 to revive native Irish sports. Today there are several hundred thousand members of the GAA who play these games as amateurs, and the professional teams that compete in the All-Ireland matches often draw huge crowds. Handball is also a traditional Irish sport. Soccer and rugby are widely popular, and Irish players are prominent on the rosters of professional teams throughout the world. The Irish are extremely passionate about horse racing, and the Irish Derby draws Europe's best competitors to the Curra, the flat racetrack in County Kildare. Greyhound racing events are also well attended. The Olympic Council of Ireland was formed in 1922, and Ireland's official participation in the Olympic Games began in Paris in 1924. Irish athletes had competed for Great Britain in previous games, since 1896. Since then Ireland has missed only the 1936 games. The first medal by an Irishman came in 1896, when John Boland won a gold medal in tennis for Great Britain. The first medal for the Irish team came in 1928 in Amsterdam, where Patrick O'Callaghan won a gold in the hammer throw. In 1996 Michelle Smith became the first Irish female athlete to win a gold medal, capturing three gold medals in swimming. 
Katie Taylor won a gold medal in women's boxing in 2012. Education and social welfare. Irish children from 6 to 15 years old are required by law to go to school. The primary schools are free. The secondary schools are private institutions, and most are operated by religious orders of the Roman Catholic Church. Nevertheless, Irish secondary schools receive substantial government aid and are subject to inspection by the Department of Education and Science. The administration of the nation's vocational schools resembles that of the secondary schools. The University of Dublin, or Trinity College, was founded in 1592, and the National University of Ireland was established in 1908. The National University is a federal institution consisting of universities in Dublin, Galway, Cork, and Maynooth as well as several colleges. The University of Limerick and the Dublin City University were created in 1989. In addition, Ireland has institutes of technology in Athlone, Blanchardstown, Carlow, Cork, Dublin, Dunleary, Dundalk, Galway, Letterkenny, Limerick, Sligo, Tallacht, Tralee, and Waterford. St. Patrick's College in Maynooth trains Roman Catholic priests but also admits other students. All the universities and colleges receive financial support from the government. An agency called the Health Service Executive, established in 2005, is responsible for administering health services in Ireland under the general supervision of the Department of Health and Children. Health examinations, child welfare clinics, and the treatment of infectious diseases are available to everyone without charge. Otherwise, the cost of public health services depends on the patient's means. Persons who cannot afford to pay are entitled to a comprehensive health service free of charge. Most workers contribute to pay related social insurance. Benefits include widows and widowers pensions, unemployment and disability benefits, one parent family payments, and old age pensions. The poor receive certain benefits regardless of their ability to contribute to the insurance fund. Major cities. Most of Ireland's population is urban. The capital, Dublin, is an affluent city whose metropolitan area is home to about a quarter of the country's people. The city's old dockside neighborhoods have given way to new residential and commercial development. Cork, Ireland's second largest city, is a cathedral city and port in the southwest. Other important urban centers include Waterford, Wexford, and Drogheda on the east coast, Sligo in the northwest, and Limerick and Galway in the west. Economy. For centuries the Irish economy depended heavily on agriculture, but now industry and services are dominant. During the late 1990s Ireland experienced an economic boom spurred by its high technology sector. The country's growth was more than double that of most other countries in the European Union, and unemployment fell to historically low levels. Though growth moderated in the early 21st century, Ireland's economy remained one of the most vital in Europe. Exports and investment by foreign companies were important to Ireland's economic success. Ireland's economic growth temporarily came to an end amid a global financial crisis that began in 2008-09. The country's real estate and construction industries collapsed, and the banks that had loaned them money were poised to fail. The government spent large sums to rescue the banks, and the national deficit ballooned. The economy went into a severe recession that lasted several years. As part of an international bailout package for the Irish financial system, Ireland made major spending cuts and tax increases. Within several years, the Irish economy had improved. Agriculture, forestry, and fishing. Agriculture in Ireland consists largely of the grazing of cattle and sheep. The moderate, moist climate favors the growing of grass and hay, and farm animals can be outside for most of the year because of the mild winter temperatures. About two-thirds of the agricultural land of Ireland consists of permanent pasture. Beef, dairy products, especially milk, and other livestock products account for most of the agricultural output. The leading crops include sugar beets, barley, wheat, and potatoes. Barley is the principal crop in terms of acreage. It is used by the brewing and distilling industries and as feed for farm animals. When Ireland was established as an independent country in 1922, Forests represented less than 1% of the land area. However, because of replanting efforts since World War II, forests now cover about one-tenth of the land area. In 1988, the government established a company to manage the country's commercial forestry. Ireland has rich fishing grounds, particularly off the west coast. The deep-sea catch includes herring, whiting, and mackerel. 
lobsters, crayfish, shrimp, and oysters are caught near the coast. Industry. Industry has expanded in Ireland since the 1950s, when a government agency called the Industrial Development Authority began to encourage investment from abroad. Now called IDA Ireland, the agency continues to grant tax concessions and other incentives to attract foreign companies. By the early 21st century more than 1,000 foreign firms had operations in Ireland, and they accounted for more than four-fifths of the country's exports. IDA Ireland especially targets companies in high-value industries that require a well-educated workforce, such as information technology, pharmaceuticals, and medical technology. Ireland ranks among the world's leading exporters of computer software and pharmaceuticals. These modern enterprises now dominate economically the traditional Irish industries, many of which involve the processing of agricultural products. However, meatpacking, dairy production, grain milling, sugar refining, and brewing and malting are still widespread throughout the farming areas of Ireland. The manufacture of textiles and clothing remains important as well. Although mining is only a small part of the economy, Ireland ranks among Europe's leading producers and exporters of zinc and lead. Gypsum, limestone, and silver are also mined. Imported bauxite is processed to make alumina, the basis of aluminum. Ireland produces some natural gas and coal, but the country remains heavily dependent on imports to meet its energy requirements. The most abundant energy resource is peat, which is used to produce electricity and to heat homes in some rural areas. Services. Services have overtaken industry to become the primary source of income and employment in Ireland. The International Financial Services Centre, in central Dublin, is a concentration of more than 500 international companies in such fields as banking, insurance, and asset management. Like the foreign manufacturers, many of these companies were drawn to Ireland by tax breaks provided by the government. In addition, IDA Ireland has attracted foreign companies offering such business services as consulting, data processing, and technical support. Ireland's economy depends heavily on trade, especially the export of manufactured goods. The chief exports include chemicals, especially medical drugs, office machines, processed foods, and beverages. Ireland is among the world's leading exporters of computer software. Ireland imports machinery and transportation equipment, chemicals, and petroleum and petroleum products. The United Kingdom is Ireland's principal trading partner. Others include the United States, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and China. Tourism is also pivotal to Ireland's economy. The majority of tourists come from the United Kingdom, though many also come from other European countries and the United States. Many tourists are relatives or friends of the millions of Irish people who emigrated from the island. Transportation and Communications Ireland is well served by highways, railways, airlines, and water transportation. Because of Ireland's scattered rural population, the network of roads is extensive. Almost all of the roads are paved. Regular rural bus routes extend to many small, isolated communities. Railroads run between Dublin and the country's larger cities and towns. Aer Lingus was founded as the Irish National Airline and later became a private company. It has flights to and from European and transatlantic airports. Dublin, Shannon, Cork, and Knock have international airports. Shannon was the world's first duty-free airport. Most of Ireland's international trade is shipped through ports on the east and south coasts, especially Dublin and Cork. The ports at Limerick and Galway serve Western Ireland. Passenger ships provide frequent connections with Wales and England. Radio Telefis Aeran, RTE, the government-owned radio and television broadcaster, began radio service in 1926 and television service in 1961. It operates two television channels and four radio stations, one of which broadcasts in Irish. TG4, an independent television station, also broadcasts in Irish. Every owner of a television set or radio pays an annual license fee, which helps to fund RTE. Dublin is the center of Ireland's publishing industry, and nearly all of the Republic's periodicals are based there. Leading dailies include the Irish Independent and the Irish Times of Dublin and the Irish Examiner of Cork. All the newspapers are in English. Government. Ireland's constitution, adopted in 1937, established the country as a parliamentary democracy. The executive branch consists of the President, the Prime Minister, Taoiseach, and the Cabinet. 
The president, elected by popular vote every seven years, is head of state and has a mostly ceremonial role. The prime minister is the leader of the political party, or coalition of parties, that holds the most seats in parliament. The prime minister heads the cabinet, which holds executive power. Parliament, the legislative branch, consists of a House of Representatives, called the Dale Ayaran, and a Senate, called the Senad Ayaran. The 158 members of the Dale are elected by the people. The Senad has 60 members, some nominated by the Prime Minister, others elected by the universities, and the rest selected from representatives of education, agriculture, labor, industry, and public administration. The justice system consists of judges appointed by the President on the advice of the Cabinet. The Supreme Court is the Court of Final Appeal. Local government is in the hands of 29 county councils, 5 city councils, 5 borough councils, and numerous town councils. The city councils govern the largest cities, Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Galway, and Waterford. All of these local councils are responsible for such services as planning, housing, roads, and water supply but have no authority over education or police. History. The first inhabitants of the island of Ireland were hunters and fishers who arrived on the eastern coast from the European mainland about 6000 BC. Later settlers brought knowledge of agriculture about 3000 BC and skills in bronzeworking by about 2000 BC. Celts who came from Europe about 300 BC dominated the earlier peoples, mainly because the Celts had ironworking knowledge. During its early period, Ireland had one of the more advanced civilizations of Western Europe. Well-organized communities during the Neolithic period constructed an array of impressive stone monuments, including Newgrange and Noth, two magnificent megalithic tombs located in County Mead. Hill Fort building was characteristic of the Iron Age, as was the construction of ring forts, raths. Many artificial islands, called Cranachs, were also constructed in Ireland between the Late Bronze Age and the European Middle Ages. In addition, early Irish craftsmen produced a large amount of metalwork. Adapting techniques that originated in Britain or on the European continent, skilled artisans created many fine objects, including the Ardag and Darinaflon chalices, two of the best-known examples of Irish ecclesiastical metalwork, and the superbly crafted Celtic pin known as the Terra brooch. Another Irish treasure is the celebrated Cross of Kong, a richly decorated medieval processional cross. Missionaries established Christianity in Ireland by the beginning of the 5th century ad. However, the earliest firm date associated with Christianity on the island is 431, when Pope Celestine I sent the Bishop Palladius from Gaul to Ireland. St. Patrick, who is most commonly credited with converting the Irish to Christianity, arrived soon thereafter. The monasteries established by St. Patrick and other missionaries enabled a world of classical learning to be introduced on the island, and this learning was later carried to many parts of Europe. During the 9th and early 10th centuries, Viking raiders overran the south and east coasts of Ireland. They ravaged the monasteries and churches and later became traders in the coastal towns. The Vikings were finally defeated in 1014 at Clontarf, near Dublin, but some remained in coastal settlements and were accepted by the Irish. English Rule The English conquest of Ireland began when a local ruler asked King Henry II and his barons to help him regain his kingdom. Some of the barons arrived first, in 1169, and Henry followed in 1171. Henry encouraged his followers to seize parts of the island and hold them as fiefs of the crown. Henry's descendants intermarried with the local population and increasingly adapted Irish customs. However, the English did not control the island effectively, and they regarded the Irish and the English-Irish as their enemies. The authority of the English crown was eventually restored over the entire island during the 16th century by Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, who also attempted to suppress the Roman Catholic Church. Three failed rebellions during Elizabeth's reign, 1558-1603, solidified Irish resentment of English rule. In 1607, four years after the English put down the third of these rebellions, its leader, Hugh O'Neill, 2nd Earl of Tyrone, and scores of other Gaelic chieftains in the northern province of Ulster fled from Ireland. This so-called, Flight of the Earls, marked the end of Gaelic Ulster. Britain declared the Earls guilty of treason and subsequently seized their great estates. Elizabeth's successor, James I, initiated the policy that became known as the Plantation of Ulster, which involved sending Scottish and English Protestants to settle on seized land in the province. 
Soon afterward thousands of settlers, mostly from lowland Scotland, were introduced into Ulster, and particularly into its eastern portions, which became predominantly Protestant as a result. The Catholics of Ulster rebelled in 1641 and killed thousands of Protestant settlers. This revolt spread to the south but was put down by Oliver Cromwell from 1649 to 1650. He took much land and many rights away from Irish Catholics. James II, a Roman Catholic, tried to reverse the discriminatory policies of the preceding rulers. After being driven from the throne by the Revolution of 1688, James went to France and then to Ireland. There he was welcomed by the Irish Catholics, who hoped he could lead them in regaining their land. In 1690 James and the Irish were defeated by the Protestant forces of the English King William III in the Battle of the Boyne. Anglicans then dominated Ireland for about 150 years. Catholics and non-Anglican Protestants had few legal rights, and they could not vote or hold office. By the 1760s opposition leaders in the Irish Parliament had begun to agitate for political reforms. Henry Flood and Henry Grattan spearheaded the Patriot Movement for Legislative Independence. Following the outbreak of the American Revolution, the Patriot Movement grew rapidly in Ireland as increasingly people were influenced by the North American colonists who were rebelling against British rule. The movement had some success. In 1779 the British government renounced restrictions that it had imposed on Irish trade, and in 1782 the British relinquished their right to legislate for Ireland. The outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789 further infused democratic ideas into Ireland. However, the subsequent growth of a radical Irish movement for Catholic emancipation provoked repressive measures by the British. The Society of United Irishmen, founded in 1791 under the leadership of Irish radical Wolf Tone, became intent on insurrection. Tone sought military support from France, but several French naval expeditions to Ireland between 1796 and 1798 proved futile. The Irish Rebellion broke out in May 1798 but was widespread only in Ulster and in County Wexford in the southeast, where, despite the non-sectarian ideals of its leaders, it assumed a nakedly sectarian form resulting in the slaughter of many Protestants. The rebellion was savagely suppressed by British forces. The events of 1798 convinced the British Prime Minister, William Pitt the Younger, who had long maintained that a union of the two countries was the only solution of the Irish problem that such a union was now most urgently necessary. He accordingly planned and carried through the merger. In 1801 the Act of Union joined Ireland to Great Britain, England and Scotland, to form the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Struggle for Home Rule In 1823 the Catholics, led by Daniel O'Connell, began agitating for emancipation. In 1829 the British Parliament passed an act giving the Catholics political equality for most purposes. O'Connell then began a struggle to eliminate the Act of Union. This struggle turned into a movement later to establish home rule, or self-government, for Ireland. However, such efforts were stifled by famine and mass emigration resulting from a blight that destroyed Ireland's vital potato crop in the mid-1800s. The potato famine killed about one million people and forced even more to flee abroad. Several attempts to put through home rule bills for Ireland failed during the late 1800s. The Catholics in Southern Ireland were determined to have the right to home rule, but the Protestants in Ulster insisted on maintaining the union with Great Britain. In the last years of the 19th century, partly in reaction to political frustrations, a cultural nationalist movement developed, led by Douglas Hyde and Owen McNeill. Through the Gaelic League, founded in 1893, much was done to revive interest in the speaking and study of Irish. These cultural movements were reinforced by a radical nationalist party, Sinn Féin, We Ourselves, or, Ourselves Alone, founded in 1905 by Arthur Griffith, who preached a doctrine of political self-help. In 1914 the British Parliament passed a Home Rule Bill setting up a separate parliament for all Ireland, but World War I soon broke out and the Home Rule Act was suspended. On Easter Monday in 1916 armed members of the Irish Volunteers, a nationalist group, and the Citizen Army, an association of Irish workers, staged an unsuccessful rebellion in Dublin. This insurrection against British government in Ireland came to be known as the Easter Rising. The British executed 14 of the rebellion's leaders, which aroused public support for an independent Ireland. In the 1918 elections Sinn Féin won most of the Irish seats in the British Parliament. 
Sinn Féin had earlier pledged not to take their seats in Parliament, however, and after the election they set up an Irish Parliament, the Dale Éireann, in Dublin. The Dale issued a declaration of independence and was headed by Éamon de Valera, a surviving leader of the Easter Uprising. The English tried to suppress the new government, and violence erupted between British troops and the volunteers, who became the Irish Republican Army, IRA. In 1920 Ireland was partitioned, and separate parliaments were set up for Northern and Southern Ireland. Fighting continued until a truce was called in 1921. The terms of the truce established the southern part of Ireland as the Irish Free State, which became a dominion within the Commonwealth. Six counties of Ulster remained part of the United Kingdom under the name of Northern Ireland. For a year the Irish who accepted the dominion status fought those who demanded complete independence. This civil war ended when a ceasefire was issued in April 1923. A new constitution adopted in 1937 did not proclaim independence, but it did replace the name Irish Free State with Ire, the word for Ireland in the Irish language. The Republic. Ire officially seceded from the Commonwealth in 1948, and the Republic of Ireland was proclaimed on April 18, 1949. The new country was one of the poorest in Europe. In the late 1950s the government began to promote industrialization and foreign investment, with some success. Nevertheless, despite the relative prosperity of the 1960s and 1970s, Ireland continued to struggle with such economic problems as high inflation, unemployment, and budget deficits. In the late 1980s the government made substantial cuts in public spending, which succeeded in boosting the economy by the early 1990s. In the late 1990s the high technology sector fueled an unprecedented economic boom. Increasingly Ireland's efforts toward economic progress involved engagement with the rest of Europe. In 1961 Ireland applied for membership of the European Economic Community, EEC. Later the European Community, which was a forerunner of the European Union, EU. The application lapsed when France vetoed Britain's entry. The predominance of the British market for Irish producers was such that it made no sense for Ireland to join the EEC if Britain was excluded. Nevertheless, prominent leaders such as Sean F. Lamass, Ireland's Prime Minister from 1959 to 1966, remained unequivocally committed to Europe. Although Ireland, like Britain, did not join the EEC until January 1, 1973, the delay eased the impact of transition. In May 1987 a constitutional referendum ratified the Single European Act and confirmed Ireland's participation in the EEC. The Act called for the harmonization of social and fiscal measures taken within the EEC. It was a forerunner of the 1991 Maastricht Treaty, Treaty on European Union, which paved the way for the establishment of a European Economic and Monetary Union. A large majority of Irish voters approved the Maastricht Treaty in a referendum. Ireland adopted the euro, the EU's common currency, in 2002. Ireland became an unexpected obstacle to further European integration, however, when Irish voters rejected the Lisbon Treaty, an agreement aimed at streamlining the EU's processes and giving it a higher international profile, in a referendum in June 2008. Irish voters ultimately accepted the treaty, however, in a second referendum in October 2009. Ireland faced a severe debt crisis starting in 2008-09. The country's economic problems were partly the result of a global financial downturn. In addition, Ireland's banks had been making extravagant and unwise loans to property developers. After the Irish construction and real estate industries collapsed, the country's banks were on the brink of failing. The Irish government spent large amounts of money to stabilize the banks, and this dramatically increased the national deficit. In 2010 Ireland was compelled to accept a bailout package from the EU and the International Monetary Fund IMF. In order to meet the conditions of the bailout package, Ireland implemented what are called austerity measures, steep cuts in government spending and increases in taxes. The country began to reduce its public debt, and by the end of 2013 it was able to officially exit from the EU IMF bailout program. Once again the Irish economy began to grow. Relations with Northern Ireland have remained a perennial concern for Ireland. Beginning in the 1960s Northern Ireland's Catholics and Protestants fought over the status of the province, with Catholics urging reunification with Ireland and Protestants preferring to stay within the United Kingdom. Over Protestant opposition in Northern Ireland, 
Britain and Ireland signed an agreement in 1985 that gave the latter a voice in Northern Ireland's affairs. In the 1990s the Irish government played a pivotal role in peace talks that led to the Good Friday Agreement, Belfast Agreement, of 1998. The agreement, approved by referendum in both Ireland and Northern Ireland, gave Ireland a consultative role in the affairs of Northern Ireland. It also amended Ireland's constitution to remove its claim to the territory of the entire island. Ireland continued to promote peace as Northern Ireland's new power-sharing government faltered, largely because of the IRA's refusal to disarm. In 2005, however, the IRA renounced violence, and two years later a new Northern Ireland assembly took power. Britain's Queen Elizabeth II visited Ireland in 2010. She was the first British monarch to visit the country in 100 years and the first to visit it since it became an independent republic. You can subscribe to support our channel and turn on the notification bell to be notified of new videos.